Uh, Magnus uh, Whitley, um, you are a well-known uh, uh, writer of sailing and an expert of America's Cup and all the other things. And um, it's great to um, invite you to be our guest uh, this coming Saturday uh, for Sail Magazine. Um, and um, let us, we will talk about the America's Cup for sure, but um, let me first start um, to um, uh, ask you to say something about the, uh, the kiting uh, towards the Olympics in 2024. I know you have concerns and uh, an opinion about that choice. Yeah, I mean, my, my view is that uh, World Sailing and the IOC panicked into a decision um, without really looking and understanding um, the worldwide participation and, and how the trend is moving away from kiteboarding. I've just been down to Gernard Sailing Club, just, uh, you know, just up the road from me. And um, there out on the, out on the water um, was a, a foil boarder um, with a just, you know, without any strings, just a simple rig. And um, if you look down at, in Weymouth at the, um, the, the National Academy that we have there, you have all of the Olympic um, sailors, they come off the water from sailing Olympic boats and they all go foil boarding. They don't do kite boarding. It is, um, and I, I just feel that they've got it wrong here. Um, I, I understand what the Olympics is about. I understand that they are trying to um, favor youth and they are trying to capture a zeitgeist of um, youthful sports. And I also understand the nature of broadcast, that it is very much um, social media led. Um, it is, they're trying to find highly televisual spectacles. I think they found the wrong one here. Um, kite, kiteboard racing is not a discipline that is done um, in, in any great numbers. And, and to prove this, the Royal Yachting Association, which is the greatest winning organization in the world had to put out an appeal for 16 to 21 year olds anybody who was interested to, to come and um, learn the sport and potentially develop on an, on an olympic pathway for the royal yachting association to have to do that you know would suggest to me that there's um there just aren't the participation numbers and that we we've just basically backed a minority sport which sailing has given up a medal for a minority sport that just isn't done. And I, I, I kind of despair at world sailing. The, these decisions get made and we, the public and the media um, are, are, are almost discarded in our opinions. We just, we're just kicked by the wayside and decisions are, are, are taken that are you know, plain wrong for sailing and plain wrong for our sport. I think there are better alternatives out there. I think there were better dinghy alternatives. I think there were better um, boarding alternatives. And uh, Paris 2024, and I'm on record as saying it, I think it, we should, um, it's too late now to change. Uh, we need a real rethink of these Olympic classes and a real rethink of the, the sailing, you know, sailing medals. And uh, I look at something like the 470 and I also think that's uh, on its last legs. But we need to really get some sensible people at the apex of our uh, organization and, and try and move the sport forward positively, as, as well as acknowledging that the Olympics is a very special place. I've covered Olympic Games. I, I went to Athens in 2004. Um, I've seen it firsthand. I, I've seen Weymouth Olympics. Um, I, I get it. I get what they're trying to do, but I just think they've backed the wrong horse here. They're surfing the wrong wave. As you know, there was a choice between um, the kiting uh, or the double-handed mix offshore event. Um, what do you think of that? Should they have chosen the offshore? Yeah, hundred percent. I think uh, the the trends towards double-handed mixed sailing. Um, in, I mean, we saw it in the fast net race. You know, look at look at the videos that Shirley uh, Robertson has posted. Um, D. Kafari as well. It's a discipline that is highly competitive. Uh, it is a discipline that is extremely difficult. Um, I think it's it does tick an awful lot of the um, 
mantra boxes of the Olympics. And in France as well, where offshore sailing is everything, it would have been a wonderful event. I think there were concerns about uh, televising it. I, I think those concerns were, were nonsense. Uh, there were concerns um, you know, on, on the, the boats. Well, that was solved. They were going to have one design boats. There were concerns about the rigs and the sails. And the rigs and sail makers all said they would they would give it for free and would um, uh, Ken Reed was was very adamant that uh, sales would be one design. Um, I think we've we've missed a huge opportunity there to showcase something in France where you know it is every every young kid who who sails dinghies wants to get um, offshore as quickly as possible. Uh, I think they've they've made a, a huge error of judgment there. And, uh, and I, I sort of suspect that, that politics played into this and, um, and then the path of least resistance was, um, you know, kite foiling um, or kite boarding and, um, and it's the wrong decision. Right, well it's made, so uh, we'd have to live with it until uh, after 2024 at least and then there will be another opportunity for world shaving and perhaps IOC to um, to um, make a change. By the way, it's highly irregular that IOC has that strong influence um, on the um, on the events. I mean, they, they would say that, okay, it has to be gender equal or they have to have uh, um, uh, certain areas of restrictions, but it's very rarely happened or perhaps never happened that IOC has directly decided on, on one of the events. But may I say, this is, this is the problem. When the decision is made, there's very little accountability for the decision. Everybody I speak to says, oh yes, that wasn't, that wasn't me. It wasn't the IOC, it wasn't World Sailing. It was, at the end of the day, decisions were taken. Now, whether they were taken, um, whether, I mean, I, I've read the IOC um, and I've listened to the head of the IOC, I've read the document, I've listened to the guy, I understand it from their point of view. But it's all a case of nobody taking ultimate responsibility and saying any reason why this is good for the sport. It just seems shoehorned in at the last minute. The IOC uh, is, is faced with uh, a number of options presented by World Sailing. Those two organizations are massively interlinked. Obviously, World Sailing is, is funded entirely by, um, the, I, by the IOC. And um, with all the recent um, financial problems that they've been under, they presented, a, presented something to the IOC and the IOC just took the path of least resistance. It, it, I, I think the relationship between World Sailing and the IOC and the characters involved um, between the two organizations isn't working in the interests of our sport. It may well be working in the interests of keeping World Sailing alive, but it's not a working in the interests of our sport and taking it forward. You know, Paul Henderson um, would have uh, had a very, very different approach, a very different tactic and a very different um, outcome, I believe. Uh, that kind of a character, we need to install that kind of character who's got sailing running through his veins and uh, really wants to do something for the sport. And I just feel this is a poor decision. Um, and, and I think the the, the, the sailors or well, the boarders will put on a great spectacle. It will be something, but it's it's not um, moving the dial for me in terms of uh, taking the sport forward and and doing sailing a disservice. Okay, Magnus, um, so much uh, for Olympic sailing. Uh, as we know, there is also an, another area, non-Olympic, which is uh, capturing the interest of many people these days, and that is the America's Cup which is a big circus. Um, where is it going to be next time? Who are going to be the players? Um, which countries? Um, how do you become an America's Cup sailor? All of these things, I know that you have um, strong opinions of. Uh, uh, give us an update. Yeah, um, it's it really is, Mikhail, a, a, a case of what day is it today? So as it stands today, the America's Cup is a worry. Uh, we are faced with the prospect of the three mooted venues being Cork, Spain, wherever, and um, the Middle East, perhaps Jeddah. 
um, none of those actually coming up to scratch and um, problems at all three venues, which may well be leading the, um, the Kiwi uh, to for Team New Zealand to go back home and look again where there's all the infrastructure, there's a, a, a renewed desire coming out of uh, COVID lockdowns, there's a renewed desire and the public have woken up to uh, the, the possibility that this cup is going to go away and may never return to their, their shores. The problem that Grant Dalton has got is that he can see what is ranged against him. And the, the simple fact is that Team Ineos um, are a mighty outfit um, with money, backing um, and support from Mercedes Formula One, which Jim Ratcliffe owns a third of. Um, all their technology and he's looking at this saying in order to compete we have got um, you know fantastic design we were probably I reckon four to six months ahead in terms of the design cycle at least um, uh, over everybody else we need to continue that momentum and we need money in order to um, uh, to have a competitive team Grant Dalton is not about um, just turning up and defending in the best manner that he can. He wants to win. And he feels that there is no money. He has jabbed his tentacles into every poor um, that, that could possibly have cash in New, Ze in New Zealand. And he claims the money isn't there. There are others who say there is the money there. And um, there are some, you know, fairly big names that are willing to put some backing and support to keeping the um, cup in Auckland. But the, um, the way that this was all done was, was awful. I mean, uh, as soon as the Kiwi Home Defence uh, Syndicate was, or programme project was launched, uh, it was uh, viciously attacked uh, by Team New Zealand. <clears throat> and there were some missteps made. There were some big, big missteps um, taken um, emails to the New York Yacht Club trying to throw out the Royal Yacht Squadron as the uh, challenger of record. There, you know, by Hamish Ross, uh, who copied in Mark Dunphy, who is the, the leading the Kiwi project. It's all got supercharged and superheated. My personal view is the only game in town is Auckland. And somehow the Kiwis have got to um, recognize that. They're going to have to swallow a bit of pride, get round a table, start talking. And again, it's going to be what I called yesterday on my blog, a threadbare defence. That doesn't mean it's a bad defence. It, uh, it means that it just won't have the huge sums of money that, that they are seeking to raise by going to an overseas venue. Um, in terms of the teams, if I was a team owner just, now... Just, just let me stop you for a minute. Because um, the the amount of money that is required is not only down to the cost of running the event with um, the infrastructure for race management, etc. It's also to finance the Team New Zealand's uh, next effort. So whether the money comes from Cork or from Spain or from the Middle East, part of the money goes directly into the New Zealand defence. So what they are doing, because they cannot get the money in New Zealand, they are selling the whole package in order to finance their next defense, which is yeah. in my opinion. I, I think it's prove, yeah, it goes to prove that the America's Cup is out of hand. It's too expensive. Mm. It, and also it's political dynamite. So in uh, in Ireland, if you, you, you're saying, well, the, the event's going to cost, let's say, 100 million euros, and a part of that money has got to go to a foreign team, to fund th their participation. That's political dynamite, um, where, where politicians who are, um, you know, who are championing this, Simon Coveney is championing it. He's then got to sell it to um, not only parliament, but also to the people. And, uh, you know, it doesn't really work. Same with Spain. The difference with the Middle East is obviously you have um, a different political structure where um, the, the, the expense being expensed doesn't need to be accounted for. Um, so if it is going to go overseas, my view is it's going to go to the Middle East, but then you have all the problems of, um, you know, the, 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 the sort of geopolitical problems, and you also have um, the wind and wind conditions 
and having to run the event in the northern hemisphere and certain times of the year when it's very very hot there it may it may just not work but we're hearing that there there could be other uh, middle eastern more favorable middle eastern countries um that that may well be in the in you know in the mix people like bahrain oman uh and if that's the case uh, we could well be headed to an America's Cup in the Middle East. Obviously, Emirates is the big sponsor and is backed by the Dubai Corporation. So, um, you know, it could be going there. We don't know. There's, everybody's gone very, very quiet. Jeddah, I was being told, was nailed on and absolutely certain. And now that's gone extremely quiet. Um, so my guess is that the, the Arabs are shuffling this around and, and looking where else they could put it. Um, but there is a very big problem is that this is not a sporting event that lasts for a weekend or it's a boxing match that's one evening. This is, you know, teams will decamp there for three years. Kids will go to school in the local schools. Um, wives and girlfriends will move out there. Um, so, you know, does it work in the Middle East? I, I'm, I'm not saying it doesn't, but it, there's some big questions there. I think in terms of uh, American participation, if it's in Saudi Arabia, it's going to be very, very difficult for them. Um, anywhere in the Middle East is going to be difficult for, for um, you know, New York Yacht Club to, to put a challenge in. It's all leading down to back to New Zealand and where if they could somehow get it over the line, it's the right thing to do and they will get the maximum number of participants, which is what they desperately need. And also, uh, both Team Ineos and uh, the American team uh, have kept their boats in Zealand. Yeah, so um, I was joking with somebody the, uh, the other day, uh, Tom Eamon, and I was saying, um, we kept on saying, follow the money. Now we're saying, follow the boats. So, um, uh, yes, they are. Ineos is down there. American Magic is down there. Um, it, it, <laughs> I, I discarded it as just being that's where they are because they don't have a base to come back to. Uh, and that may well be the case um, because Ineos does not no longer have has its base in uh, Portsmouth over in England. So they don't have a natural place to, to put the boats in and store them. Um, but it's now looking potentially like a political move to keep the boats there. Um, and but who knows? I, I, I certainly get a sense that uh, Team New Zealand have now done the, the world tour. They've seen all the bidding venues. Um, they've seen the recommendations from Origin Sports Group. And the three venues that, are, that, that, are, that were put forward may well have, each one has a problem. Um, and that the path of least resistance here is going to be Auckland. Uh, but somehow they've got to find the money for it. Right. Um, the Team Ineos obviously um, have them on it. Um, do you think that it is possible that they would support um, uh, Auckland for the next America's Cup? If you'd asked me a few days ago, I'd say no. Um, I don't think Jim Ratcliffe is in the business of um, supporting foreign teams. Um, and, you know, I think he's there to win the America's Cup. And if I was him, I would look at the situation now and say, crikey, we've got the, um, the defender you know, on the rack at the moment. Um, they have got no money. They've got internal problems uh, back in New Zealand with Mark Dunphy um, and the Kiwi home defence thing. They've, they, they've set their stalls out. They've gone around the world. They've looked at the different venues. Uh, if I was Jim Ratcliffe, I'd sit pretty, pretty at the moment and say, well, look, over to you. What are you going to do? Is he in the business of financing um, a cup in New Zealand? Hmm. Uh, there would be string. Well, I, I I would put strings strings into that one. Um, I, I think it's unlikely to be honest. I think they are what they're going to show on Monday at their sort of their inside tack um, show is a show of strength that they are there and they're going to scare the living daylights out of the rest of the um, uh, rest of the challengers and the defender. Uh, this I think suddenly on Monday we're going to see what. Um, what, how serious they really are about winning the America's Cup. Right. And that brings me to the next question. Uh, who are going to be the challenges for um, the next America's Cup? So 
certainly Team Ineos will be there. Um, that's you know, it's a challenger record. They are nailed on and they are all guns blazing at the moment. They are um, behind the scenes. They are rock and roll. Now, if it's in Auckland, we could see um, the New York Yacht Club. Uh, they've sidled with Stars and Stripes rather than with the American Magic team. Um, there's rumours of an enormous Microsoft deal um, of, of, you know, eye-watering sums. Um, there are rumours around New, but New York Yacht Club at the moment has, um, I hear, has got um, quite a lot of problems um, politically internally. Um, so where, what they do will, you know, and how that plays out and whether the Commodore can weather the, the membership storm, um, if that plays out, then the New York Yacht Club will be there. Um, the persistent rumours of a lingi will just not, not go away. But I think the all commentators who have ever followed Ernesto Bertarelli know that he is all about winning. He is not going to just make up the numbers. And if he's going to do it, he's going to, um, it's going to be a, a top level uh, challenge. Rumours that he, he might would have, be part he would have problems with the nationality rules, wouldn't he? Yes, I mean this is the and, the, and this is the anti Ernesto clause, the nationality rule. Um, he's going to have huge problems with that, um, and I think a condition of him entering would be a modification of that of that uh, nationality rule. But I can't see Ineos agreeing to that. Why would they? Uh, and I can't see the New Zealanders agreeing to that. Again, why would they? So Alingi uh, has an op perhaps has an option to go and buy into the Luna Rossa team. Um, and you know, Luna Rossa came very close last time, and to and to take that forward. Um, but there's, you know, everybody is very quiet. Ernesto, there we I hear rumours every single day about Ernesto's doing this, he's doing that, he's spoken to these people, he's buying these sailors. But I think there's so many problems. And then what they're going to see on Monday with Ineos that may just make them go. Look, let's let's sit this one out. Um, we, we'll we'll go in 2028, and um, you know let's you know let, let's plan for them. It all feels a little bit last minute, and you know the rumours of him trying to you know come in at the last minute and um, you know get the design of Te Rahuti, the uh, the Team New Zealand boat, and all that kind of Machiavellian stuff. I think is um, un unlikely, um, and it, it, I think there's there's they're very very clever operators at Ineos and very clever operators at Team New Zealand that will preclude uh, any any backdoor challenge coming through. I think the only door really in for him now is through the Luna Rossa um, angle, and um, and he always you know he is part Italian, um, so he's got you know he he's he's got uh, connections there. Um, and that could be very interesting if they do that, because with Ernesto and the full Alinghi team siding with um, uh, what is already established as a fantastic racing team, that could be the, the, the other challenger. Um, I don't I just don't see um, emerging nations coming into this. Um, I don't see any challenge from Australia or France, which would be lovely. I think it's going to be a very limited field next time. Right. In, in your blog today, you list up a few names, um, the future stars or the present and future stars uh, of the America's Cup. Uh, share them with us. So I, I, I maintain that there are there are five key superstars, um, which is uh, Ben Ainsley, Tom Slingsby, Nathan Outridge, Jimmy Spithill and Pete Burling. And um, Going through all of those, I mean, they've all been on the Sail GP circuit, which I, I think has been fantastic this year. They've all been on that circuit. They've all um, shown flashes of brilliance. Um, I, I think really Tom Slingsby is the one that really stands out as not only for his performance at Sail GP, but his performance in the Moth Worlds. Um, I, I think he, and, and obviously, the Olympics as well. I think he's just inc an incredible, incredible sailor. Um, I, I would rate him probably as the greatest um, natural talent that we have today. Ben Ainsley is 
you know, the CV speaks for itself. You know, the, the achievements are incredible. And what Ben has shown in Sale GP is that by sheer, you know, willpower and skill, you know, he's right up there. I think the, the really interesting one is Nathan Outeridge because uh, Nathan was excluded, obviously, from the last um, America's Cup. He wasn't taken up um, and went into commentary. And what we've seen in Sale GP is if it goes light, he's amazing. I mean, absolutely incredible. I think that he's, you know, would definitely be, he'd definitely add a great deal to any team entering. And then you've got Jimmy Spithill and Pete Burling. Now, Pete Burling, I, 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 can't um you know obviously double america's cup winner and gold medalists and silver medalists and everything else just a terrific talent in our sport but this year i i, I haven't seen pete at the the very highest level i haven't seen him um uh you know he's almost like living on living on borrowed time and living on old memories and there's something just not clicking with him and with jimmy spithill i think um you know, people have got his number. Um, there's obviously he comes with a high amount of aggression, a high amount of uh, competitiveness, and uh, but he's had a shocking sale GP season, and uh, you know has his star waned a bit. I think these things go in cycles, and one year they're they're off target, the next year they're on target. Um, but yeah, the the real superstars today are Slingsby and Ainsley. Can Ben keep it going for another three years? That's a question. Um, and I think the INEOS announcement on Monday will be very, very interesting to see who's going to support him and who's going to be the CEO, because I don't think Ben can do all of those roles, um, you know, and take all the flack for the team if we're going to see the best of him. Right. And back to Spitting, I mean, he could, uh, in theory, represent more than one country. He's a, he's a born Australian. He's now an American citizen and he sailed for Italy the last time. So in theory, he could sail for all of these countries, shouldn't he? Well, so, I mean, it really comes down to, um, you know, who's got, you know, who's going to challenge. So at the moment, I can't see any challenge coming from, I mean, he could go to potentially to America because he's, I think he lives in San Diego. Um, I think the most likely thing is that he will stay with the Lunar Rossa team. They very much liked him. He definitely added uh, an edge. He brought Checo Bruni along fantastically. And, you know, I think he was, uh, he sailed brilliantly in uh, the later stages of the America's Cup. I, I didn't think he sailed particularly well at the beginning, but he sailed very, very well at the end. And that's when the team gelled together. What's interesting is Sail GP is largely one design and Jimmy has not had a great season. So uh, I think, Luna Rossa will be looking at that. I think that they will be saying, okay, um, let, let's, let's see how next season plays out. He'll definitely be in there. Um, you know, and does, does Jimmy make the boat, um, you know, in the, in the next cup? I, you know, it's too early to say. But yeah, Jimmy's, Jimmy needs to do something special pretty soon. He was, he's coming, he's definitely coming. And it may be just a secular, um, cyclical thing that uh, you know his form is a little bit off. But let me just say, Mika, we are talking really on the fine margins here. All of them are amazing sailors, and mm. any of them in the right team will win. Um, mm. And 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 I have to be absolutely clear about that. That we are talking the difference between you know Lionel Messi and uh, Cristiano Ronaldo. It's it's fine fine margins. And um, and it's and it's also down to form as well. And you can't keep form for a, you know for four years. It's just very very difficult. I mean, the fact that Pete and Blair scored a silver medal in the Olympics, uh, we should be applauding that. It's actually seen as a bit of a failure. But I mean, heaven's sake, it's a silver medal in the Olympics. I mean, you know, who are we to to criticise? But it's the manner in which it was lost. You know, there was it was gold all the way. He was leading all the way through that regatta. And then take them right at the end, and um, you know I couldn't see any other winner than than Pete Burling, and I think you know it's keeping up your form for four years, having come off an America's Cup campaign, really really difficult. So uh, they are all terrific sailors. They are our generation, and uh, one of them is going to is going to win, and one of them is going to take all the glory, and it's it's the one of those five. From from where do you recruit the future America's Cup sailors? Uh, 
Um, in the past, many of them have come from the Finn class, uh, but that's no longer the Olympic class. So, so the elite is not going to be staying there. Are they coming from Moss, from 49ers, from NACRA? What do you think? Well, I mean, I think sailing is changing and, I, I, you know, the usual pathway of starting an optimist, progress up to a laser, move into the fin uh, or maybe do an Olympic campaign. You know, th th this is going this is going to change and we are living through a revolution of, um, of, of how children are now sailing um, and, and their desire now is is not necessarily to mimic what Ben Ainsley did. They're looking at what the foilers are doing. Um, we've seen uh, classes like the WASP class, they're suddenly just, uh, they've just gone completely crazy. And I think the International Moth, um, which is akin to driving a, you know, a, a highest tuned Ferrari you can possibly get your hands on. Um, I think the superstars of tomorrow are going to come from, you know, in, from those classes. I mean, I, I was involved in a fantastic um, attempt to sail across the channel in a WASP. Um, and I was on the support boat for Hattie Rogers. And this is a young lady who, um, with the world at her feet, in my opinion, who, um, you know, incredible sailor and, you know, came through optimists and 420s and, uh, you know, the, the RS boats, um, you know, through the youth development, but is now performing at a high level and is going to move into moths. And, that's the pathway now. And when I go down to my local sailing club, the kids there, they, they're, they're learning because they just want to get into a foiler as quickly as possible. And uh, so it's going to change. I think we're going to see this, the, the five that I was talking about, dominate the pro professional circuit for a, a while. The ones coming through, um, it, it, you know, it's, it's almost a lost generation behind them. Um, I think, I think people like Slingsby and co will be the big dominant forces uh, in the America's Cup for probably two to three cycles now. Pete Burling as well, two to three cycles. I think this is Ben's last cycle. I think this is probably, possibly Jimmy's last cycle. Nathan is probably getting maybe one, maybe two. So you've got 10 or 12 years of these guys really dominating and supported by sailors like Paul Goodison and Giles Scott and people like that. Then we've got to really look who's coming through those foiling classes. And um, you know, I think we'll, we'll be quite surprised. It will be those with, you know, who get the opportunity in something like Sail GP that will be the next generation. You, you said Sail GP, which is a huge success. Uh, I agree with you. But uh, is it sustainable? I mean, it depends entirely on Larry Hilton's money and how long is he going to finance this circuit, do you think? Well, I mean, and, and all credit to Larry for doing it. I mean, we, where would we be without um, people putting this kind of money and um, in, into into our sport? Uh, uh, Larry doesn't sound as though he's going anywhere anytime soon. He's enjoying it. Um, he's turning up at events. Uh, he's more active in Sail GP than we uh, than we know, and and than is than is public. Um, you know, he is uh, heavily involved. So. They want to make it a sustainable event. They want to make it Formula One. Um, the, the problem is that sailing isn't Formula One. It doesn't have the worldwide appeal. I think what they've done with SailGP is remarkable. Um, the sponsors that are now being attracted to it and these events weekend, you know, weekend after weekend are really getting you know, real traction. They're capturing a very different um, eyeball than before. It's not necessarily sailors. The amount of people I know who say, gosh, I've just seen this for the first time, um, you know, and the, the general public seeing it, it's a long, it's a long tail thing. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. There's nothing in our sport um, that, that will capture a, a, a mass appeal, foiling boats, anything. It's just not going to get to the numbers that, um, uh, you know, Formula One can get to. I think uh, it will become sustainable. I think it will. I think by dint of sponsors wanting to be, um, you know, there's some fabulous photos and footage and stuff that you can uh, uh, really capitalize on from a marketing perspective. I think people will want to get involved. And also the key is keeping the sailors in there, keeping the Ben Ainsley's, the Tom Slingsby's, the Nathan Ostridge's, keeping them in there. Uh, because those superstars really, really do, you know, add something to it.
<laughs> just one second, Mikhail, I'm just gonna let my dog out. <laughs> Um, Magnus, um, it's been a great pleasure to talk to you. Um, I think we could go on and on and on, but we have to leave that to another occasion. But uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge and uh, your wisdom with us, and uh, and um, we'll speak soon, I hope. Mikhail, it's been an absolute pleasure. Speak soon.